the City of Albuquerque Public Art Urban Enhancement Division and Department of Arts and Culture proudly present Take Another Look. Built on the foundation of two city ordinances, art in municipal places, and the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund, the Public Art Urban Enhancement Division provides funds to artists to create art for the public, as well as arts organizations for arts and cultural programming. Join us as we discuss everything related to funding artists in the public realm with host Joni Palmer. Hello, and welcome back to Take Another Look at Albuquerque's Public Art. This is our second uh, episode of the podcast series. Today, I will be talking with Sherry Brueggemann and Ronaldo Sonny Rivera about the history of the city's public art program. I talked with Sherry Brueggemann at the first uh, episode of the podcast, so just a quick reminder. Sherry is the manager of the city's public art program. She has been with the city for 19 years. Welcome back, Sherry. Thanks. Hmm. Also with us today <clears throat> is Sonny Rivera. Sonny is a U.S. Navy veteran, barber, and sculptor who has completed over 40 full-scale public art commissions. He studied fine art at the American Academy of Arts in Chicago with nationally acclaimed sculptor and painter Eugene Hall and explored sculpting at Columbia College. He furthered his artistic vision abroad by attending the Galleria dell'Arte in Florence, Italy, and the San Miguel de Allende Institute in Mexico. Rivera's works are housed in a variety of locations and in types of spaces, from museums and botanical gardens, zoological parks, religious establishments, institutions of higher learning, and private collections throughout the United States and Mexico. Sonny, thank you for joining us in the studio today. Thank you, Joan. I have to be here. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to actually be able to do this in person. Oh, th thanks. Okay, so we'll get started. I have a few questions for both of you uh, to guide us through a conversation, and, and I really see this as you two talking amongst yourselves okay. about the history of the city's public art program oh, okay. as well as the future of the program. So my first question is about your role each of your roles, your, your places, so to speak, in the history of the city's public art program. So I'm gonna start with Sherry. Um, how do you fit into the history of the program? And, and I'm thinking about this in terms of the various roles you've had, men, who you've been mentored by, and, and also you know, talk a little bit about how our city's program compares to other programs, like size of programs, um, where it's located in city government, things like that. Sure. Well, um, I've had the fortunate um, opportunity of being able to be involved with the city's pub public art program twice. Um, I kind of volunteered my way into a, a position in the late 1990s when Gordon Church uh, was the program manager, and I was very excited to be working with him. I learned a lot from him. Um, I then took a little break and went to work for Bernalillo County Public Art Program for 10 years, and then in 2008 I came back, um, and I have been serving in the role of the program manager. Uh, ever since uh, ever since in about 16 years so 19 years with the city combined um, so Albuquerque's public art program is uh, was the 15th public art program created across the country yeah. we were the the 15th city or municipality or state or any kind of form of government that adopted a percent for art organization back in 1978 so oh. this year 2023 on november 12th will be the city's 40th anniversary 45th anniversary sorry let me make sure i get that right <laughs> 40 45 years of public art in albuquerque that's amazing and, um yeah, so in that amount of time, the public art program has existed in um, seven different departments. It's had 33 different staff members. Right now we have eight um, of those 33. It started off with one and then eventually grew into eight people. Um, and uh, we have about 1,600 pieces of art in the public art collection. And we are one of the larger public art collections in the country, even though there's... Um, cities that created their um, art ordinances um, later than us and have expanded have a mm -hmm. lot more public art than we have mm -hmm. we're kind of keeping up because of the way that our funds um, are renewed every two years through the general obligation bonds so we're one of the oldest and we're one of the biggest so well, and, yeah. and we talked last time in the first episode about what is public art <clears throat> and that public art ranges from 
the temporary from analog to digital, from inside and outside, and, and we'll talk about that more in upcoming episodes. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm so excited to be here with Sonny Rivera because Thank you, he knows all about art on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Sonny, you, um, yes, how long have you been involved with the pump? the public art program here in Albuquerque? Well, exact number, uh, I couldn't tell you that, but I've been, uh, uh, I'd say around uh, 80, you know, mid-80s. Mid okay, so you've seen a, a, a lot of, you've been part of the uh, history and the history yes. making of this yes. program. And um, can you tell us a bit about the history of the program from your perspective, you know, kind of talk about some of your earlier projects, maybe even um, some of your newer or more recent projects. Well, <clears throat> thank you for asking. And uh, it seems like I've been an artist all my life, coming from the farm. And my dad had a small farm, and we always had chickens and hogs and horses and cattle and. You know, we had to milk a cow. And anyway, uh, <clears throat> so coming into from a small town of Mesquite, south of Las, uh, south of Las Cruces, 12 miles, and mm. uh, along the uh, the Camino Real, and uh, being here in, in Albuquerque, just uh, been in the hair business before, and still I came here because of in the hair business, and um, open up my own shop. But then it also turned into art. Mm. The public art uh, uh, was opened. And I just saw this opportunities that, wow, I says, how beautiful. Because I was wondering, how, how do you get into, uh, you know, a, a museum or a, or a gallery or anything like that? And here, our own city was opening up, and, and there's opportunities that whatever it was, uh, I applied for it. Mm -hmm. I was really excited, and uh, 40 years later, I'm still involved with it, and I think we're, I'm just elated what, what's been going on, and it's opening up, and it's getting bigger and bigger, and I love it. How did you first find out about the program? How did you, you said it was, it was open, and it sounds like you were really surprised. Being in the hair business, I had a lot of clientele. Mm -hmm. And um, mostly they, they knew that uh, I was in the arts. Mm -hmm. I had something to do with the arts that I liked to do the arts. And um, that led people in. Mm -hmm. and, and I got exposure to that and listened to that and uh, but um, and reading, you know, and mm -hmm. and TV, the that's how I found right. out. So there was just a multiple right, right uh, information that I got. Yeah, it sounds like mostly word of mouth. Yes, I mean, ma'am. Today, it's uh, it's on our websites, and you can scribe, subscribe to our yes. newsletter. But uh, word of mouth is often the best way. Well, it, it's uh, it's still it's still kind of that way, right? You know, but. What was uh, what was your first piece? Um, well, it's it was uh, Sherry. Uh, you can help me with this. Uh, yeah, it was the the figurative sculpture of the first um, museum guard. Museum guard, right? Herb Candelaria. Mm -hmm. Herb Candelaria was the first museum guard, and. Uh, <clears throat> um, I don't know if it was the Gordon Church that told me about it, or mm. and uh, he was a, the guard, the first museum guard, and I I inquired about it and and uh, found out that I had uh, been chosen to do that that piece. Um, I went to his house and interviewed. Uh, was sitting with his family, his wife, and and. And then in with the city, with the, with the arts uh, department, um, they wanted a Brentwood chair, him sitting. So, so we chose 
him sitting on a Brentwood chair, so I didn't know what a Brentwood chair, so what was it, what it was. So we went to the to the basement of the of the arts uh, building and found a Brentwood chair and so instead of one we did two of them and we did an extra one and we met, had him sitting and um, we did an extra one so he could so I have another other person come by and sit down and, and oh, okay. talk with him and it was I try to to have some kind of interaction with the sculptures I do mm -hmm. and um this was a quiet, you know, moment for so you you you, you do a, a multiple uh, um, sittings or positions mm -hmm. until you settle down into right and and you get help from the families and and from the art people to to um, help you organize and and which which way it would be. Right, right. The proper way. Make it work. Yes, ma'am. All right. And uh, now it's, um, they have a Candelaria part in the Albuquerque Museum. Mm hmm And it's his own, his own uh, uh, you know, where you have a stadium, you know, overlooking the, all these people, are, but he's up on top. Oh, he's okay. one of the audience, you know. Yeah, that's partaking. great. Yeah. Yeah. It must be really fun to see your your early work and all of the work that has accumulated around it, you know, uh, across the city. Well, I've been very lucky, and um, uh, I think that we have the best uh, of art, uh, business, and community, and and people are very art art oriented. You know, in the state, um, I mean, we have such beautiful mountains and, right. and just the local stuff and Santa Fe and and it's just man, it's just uh, Albuquerque is bigger and bigger and bigger and and the art business also. So, mm -hmm. so I've been I've been in a place that um, it benefited me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is a pretty special place. Um, well, I, I have, I'm, to continue this conversation, the next thing I'd like to talk about is what you think have been the most significant things that have happened in the public art program in Albuquerque. So I'm going to start with Sherry again. Um, based on what you just told us about the program, what do you think have been some of the major events that have helped define the program? Sure, well, <clears throat> of course, um, the if you're... A local, you're from Albuquerque. You know any, of any of Albuquerque's history, and particularly public art. You've heard about the um, infamous uh, controversy of the cruising San Mateo uh, sculpture, which is also known as uh, by its nickname, which I'm not really <laughs> supposed to say, but it is. Uh, Do you want me to it, say it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the nickname is uh, Chevy on his stick, and um, that sculpture. Uh, created a very, uh, very large controversy, but it also put into the awareness of everybody in Albuquerque that we even had a public art program. Mm. I think before that, a lot of people didn't even know what public what public art was. There were little things popping up here and there, but that really um, helped people be aware that we had a public art program. So that was that was a really big defining moment moment for the public art program. It also uh, triggered a city council mandate to evaluate the process and how mm -hmm. artists are selected, how much funding would be put into different types of projects. So that gave um, the early management an opportunity to sort of really evaluate the methods and the processes mm -hmm. and um, create uh, competitions, which that project was a competition, but it really just emphasized comp competitions. And I know Sonny has a couple words to say about that, but um, uh, then the other thing I think that was a major game changer was um, when um, we changed the ordinance. Uh, well, there's there's three other quick changes. Um, two two short ones. One was to um, 
uh, change the ordinance to allow for conservation funds to be mm -hmm. um, a, per a percentage to be used to take care of the art that we funded because a, a lot of art was uh, being acquired out there in the community and there were no funds set aside to manage it and to clean them and to do restoration and conservation. So that was a major ordinance change that um, just made things much better for our citizens because they knew we had the resources to take care of it. Uh, then we had a change um, in the... Um, uh, early 2000s, uh, I'm sorry, early 2010s, I guess it was like 2013, um, that allowed us to fund uh, murals on private property mm. in partnership with a private property owner, um, but also to do public art on orphan signs, which are the old mm. Route 66 signs that have sort of been abandoned or not taken care of um, on Central Avenue. So we have a special way of being able to do public art on those. And as we're coming into the 100th anniversary of Route 66, that's going to be an exciting thing for us. And then finally, just last October, in October 2022, um, City Council approved changing the ordinance um, funding amount from 1% of the general obligation bonds to 1.5%. And that is a game changer for us because yeah. the majority of that extra half a percent goes into care and maintenance of the existing collection, which after 44 years has become quite large mm -hmm. and we need to, we have a lot of works to take care of. Um, but it also allowed us to do temporary public art and digital public art, which the idea with that is, is that we can still fund artists, we can put fun things out in the community, but they are intended to go away so we don't have to take care of them. <laughs> and so it's quite a different, uh, it's quite a, a, a change of thought um, from artists like Sunny, who works in bronze and they are permanent and they are out there for a very long time. But um, having those extra source of funds to be able to take care of them is really important. Well, is this typical in public art programs for the ordinance changes? Yeah, I would say uh, across the country, um, a lot of programs have been able to increase their funding. Um, they've also been able to change what, what the definitions are of public art. Um, some of them, like us, get embroiled in a controversy, and the elected officials want something to change. So ordinance changes are, are um, definitely a tool that mm -hmm. it works for the better. Um, there have been some ordinances uh, that have been changed to the point of basically eliminating a public art program in a city mm. or a town, which is really sad, but right. um, usually they come back even more strong. <laughs> right. Well, Sonny, I'm, and I'm gonna pick up on a couple of things, Sherry, that you were mentioning, especially about um, conservation and maintenance. But, um, so you've completed eight city projects, mm -hmm. plus two with Bernalillo County, and now you have a new one that's in the process. Um, so, if you could tell us a little bit about the project that you're currently working on, oh. um, and how has um, how has the public art program process, um, your interactions, your relationship with staff, how has it changed over the years? Well, uh, I've had uh, you know. Uh, 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 opportunity to to work with some of these people that that are very uh, I feel that you know very informative uh, for whatever I wanted to uh, that uh, you know I, I could ask and um, they would they would be there mm -hmm. and uh, whatever I needed to do but um, uh, I've had I've had a good a good experience with with the public oh, with the uh, city arts department and, and and has it how do you think it's changed i mean if you were to talk to an up-and-coming public artist and tell them about your experience with the public art program what things would you highlight and and advice would you give that person well i think it's getting, it's getting uh wherever they get their information from and what they need um i think it's it's broader the information is broader, and you have to. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the information that we get from from people wanting public art, mm -hmm. it's it's getting bigger. You know the awareness. Right, right. Um, so I feel um, it's a good time to be an artist. Right. Uh, because uh, the opportunities are there. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I just I just uh, feel myself uh, very lucky to to be in this business. Well, what is your current project that you're working on? Um, the name of this is Stalking Her Prey. And uh, again, it's, a, uh, it's about a mountain lion. Uh, uh, being uh, 10 feet tall, um, the body of a grown mountain lion is it's fairly big, uh, you know, maybe two feet, but maybe four or five feet long but stalking her prey and I feel like like they're very sneaky <laughs> and they're this one is uh, is walking and um, camouflaging uh, amongst rocks large large rocks and there's those rocks are uh, this big other large mountains made out of rock you know mm -hmm. most most lives all rock but um <clears throat> at the top he's he's very low and crouching and and he's uh he's stalking and he's ready if he needs to you mm -hmm. know he wants if he gets hungry enough he's gonna go for it right right but um it'll um It'll, uh, I did a maquette, and it was uh, it was accepted, and as it forced me to do the the large one, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I'm doing right now. That's I mean it, it's in the process. Yeah, and that's going in at the Alamosa Park. Yeah, and when is it slated to be installed? Uh, hopefully this year. Great, and I'm sure we'll be able to find out about, there'll be a dedication, and oh, yeah. we'll be able to, yeah. we'll learn about that on, on your website. Yes, absolutely, it'll be one of my many dedications with Sunny at <laughs> one of his public art projects <laughs> in the city. All right, well, um, actually, uh, we were talking right before, um, when we were getting ready, you were talking about the materials that you use, and um, that you get them from various places. Yes. Can you say a little bit about that? Uh, because of uh, <clears throat> the the final uh, the piece that that uh, like for instance the cat um, to use bronze in this large there's a pedestal and to use bronze all the way uh, uh, bronze is uh, one of the most expensive. Um, uh, it's maybe the uh, th three fifty a pound, mm -hmm. and uh, a one ingot, one uh, ten pound ingot is a. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, at one one uh, you know uh, three fifty a, a pound, uh, you need a few, quite a few pounds. Right. So it's really expensive uh, material to to use. And uh, the foundry, uh, you get the, the, uh, the 10, 15 pound ingot, bronze ingot, and you have to melt it. Mm -hmm. If you've been into a process of, of to a bronze uh, a, a gallery, mm -hmm. where they have to, to melt it down at 2,000 degrees to, to get it to pour. And there's 10 to 13 steps uh, to do a complete, a complete, uh, whatever part, part of the bronze is, but it still takes that 10 to 15 or 12 or 13 uh, steps. Oh, to okay, go so it's a lengthy process. Because um, they have to do all the molds, mm -hmm. and each, each, uh, each part of, say, uh, the rubber mold. Mm -hmm. As soon as you finish a piece, you take it to the foundry, and they they chalk it up and separate it. And uh, <clears throat> but it's it's uh, about seven seven coats mm. of of the uh, of, of the uh, 
um, what they use is a. Are you it, talking about the rubber that makes uh, rubber, the Rubber, but it's it's a very uh, watery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And each each process it's a little bit thicker. Right, right. So by the so it has to be thickening every. That's why, and it takes you know a couple of days to to dry each coat. Mm -hmm. But it's um, the the the, uh, <clears throat> the rubber, and then the mother mold, which is a plaster mold. And it's the, the whole thing is like a, a loss. It's called a loss wax process. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, it hasn't changed uh, much <laughs> since right? the, the Renaissance and the, you yeah. know the Da Vinci's uh, method right. of of doing the you know the big master horse you know the right. But um, it hasn't it hasn't changed much. They need they need all those steps. Right, that's amazing. Right, I mean that's what the the history of the history of materials. So that's, yeah. So that's why the cost is is what it is, and in, in the bronze pieces. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope that um, thank you, Sherry, for listening and putting this together because uh, we need more money for to make you know those big bronze pieces mm -hmm. and and then for the what you were talking about earlier sherry about conservation right mm -hmm. have, have you been concerned about that in terms of your pieces how they um the weathering and also the um and this will be a discussion in a future uh podcast but you know people are hopefully you know interacting with these sculptures and well so the weather the weather that we have is perfect for for the bronzes i've never had any problem with them Mm -hmm. Any any of my pieces, mm -hmm. other than a man-made uh, intentional, you know that a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, the, the sculpture evokes emotion, and people react to different things of what of what the subject is, mm -hmm. and either they want to paint on it. They want to destroy it some form or another, and uh, so they paint it up and you know put words on it that does not, you know. The, anyway, they they can, and I've had some that's been destroyed. Hmm. Um, you know, they'll break a arm or right. a foot or a whole leg or. And um, so I've had I've had that, but it's <clears throat> it's it was intentional. It, evidently, it uh, it, it uh, bothered people mm -hmm. that that piece was there. Right, right. But having having additional funds to be able to maintain and uh, okay. seems like a really important mm -hmm. part of for a public art program. Mm -hmm. But also my my uh, my people at the foundry. That's why when when an artist picks a foundry. It's very important that they know their business, mm. and they deliver to you. And it's not mine per se; it's the public. It belongs to the city or whatever, whoever has a, has a asked for that. Mm -hmm. It could be an individual, but uh, at this point, it's a the, the city has been a very great. So they do a lot of real good work for me. That's great. Never had any problems. Well, we have a we have a few more minutes, so I I have one final question for both of you, and and that is about where where the program is headed. So, Sonny, you've been associated associated with the program as you said for quite a while now. Yes, ma'am. Um, what are your thoughts on the direction that the program is going? What is its future? Well, I think that uh, <clears throat> uh, just recently. Uh, uh, it, it, it keeps expanding. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the one recently, about a month ago, uh, we had a meeting, uh, open meeting to the public about this uh, opening up at the at the at the airport. Things were it's been open before, but now they've they've re remodeled it mm -hmm. and did some more stuff. So there's more stuff for public art to go in there. And what um, the spaces that they've said they had, 
uh, I think it's it's, it's uh, going to help the city uh, to put information out there to the Hubble public. Cool. Yeah, that's, we'll be talking about uh, that mm -hmm. project in an upcoming episode. So mm -hmm. thank you yes. for, for, for shadowing that. Oh, okay. um, so Sherry, what are your thoughts about the direction of the program? What are you most excited about? Well, I, you know, I've said this uh, in, in, in our last episode, but also, you know, everybody I talk to knows I'm super excited about um, some of the ways that we're bringing artists together with different um, uh, sectors of our, of our, of our, you know, our economy. So working in the sciences, blending arts and technology. Um, uh, we're looking at doing some residencies where we would be able to bring artists into the public art program and be part of, you know, sort of the management, but then also realize public art um, as part of that process. So they might mm -hmm. be um, become uh, sort of like staff with mm -hmm. us, but then they might be working with, like, let's say, solid waste and thinking about how public art can be made out of uh, recycled materials or something like mm -hmm. that. So. Um, I, I'm super excited about really finding out ways to, um, or you know, pursuing ways to bring artists um, closer to the staff um, and mm -hmm. to the rest of you know other other departments in city government. Um, but also, I feel like once this new funding goes into into effect um, with the the November election with the general obligation bonds, um, uh, assuming hoping that those will will pass, uh, then um, in January, then the new infl influx of funds will come into the public art program coffers, and I think that. Um, we're going to be able to do some longer range planning and see, realize some really big projects wow. um, in the community. So, um, you know, f every mayor that I've worked for, there's been about five of them, um, have uh, always wanted to have that big, iconic piece of public art that says Albuquerque, sort of like, mm. you know, the, the Chicago right. Bean, which is the Anush Kapoor um, Cloud Gate, or, um, you know, uh, the Minneapolis uh, cherry on the spoon at the, at the museum. Um, every mayor wants to have that sort of iconic piece in Albuquerque. And mm -hmm. I just hope that someday we'll find the right place for it. Right. And because hopefully we'll have the funds to actually build that. So, um, and I know that Sunny has applied for those projects in the oh, past that's... when we've had those conversations oh, about well, yeah. iconic art for Albuquerque. So maybe that's in our future. Thank that's you. exciting. Well, so um, any final thoughts for the audience that you want to share before we um, end this this episode? Well, thank you, Sherry. We're uh, Tony. Uh, I feel I feel so lucky to be here, and thank you for having me. And I hope it doesn't stop. I hope it continues and make it all possible and bigger. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us You're and welcome. for talking with us. And thank you, Sherry, for sure, joining us again. You. And I also just want to give a little shout out to Sonny's wife, Hope, because she's always been right there helping him with his business um, of being an artist. And uh, she's, a, she's a pleasure to work with as well as Sonny. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And Hope is in the studio with us today. So again, thank you for joining us. Okay, everybody, so now you all, the podcast audience, are probably wondering, how can I become a part of the history of the program? So uh, the best way to learn about calls for artists is to subscribe to the Public Art e-newsletter, cabq.gov backslash public art backslash e-newsletter. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook, at ABQ Public Art. And finally, check out the website, and that's where you'll find lots of information about the ordinance, about things that are happening in the program, learn about the staff. Um, so again, thanks again, Sherry thank and Sonny. And thank you to our listeners. We hope that now that you've listened to this podcast, that you will go out and take another look at Albuquerque's public art. Please join us for our next episode, which will be released on Wednesday, the 11th of October. We will be talking in a bit more detail about the program's yeah. ordinance, the public art process, the collection, and a new creative inventory the city is working on. So thanks again for listening, and you can also watch on our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the Albuquerque Public Art Program, 
the Public Art Collection, opportunities for artists, and so much more, visit cabq.gov slash public art. To learn more about the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund, visit cabq.gov slash UETF. Tune in next time to take another look at the City of Albuquerque Public Art Urban Enhancement Division.